Following the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, First Republic Bank stock plummeted to a new record, low after the lender revealed that depositors had withdrawn more than $100 billion. This has raised concerns about the possibility of additional bank failures. When San Francisco-based lender First Republic revealed that it had lost 40% of its deposits in the first quarter, Due to the banking industry experiencing its worst confidence crisis since the 2007-2008 financial crisis, the stock price of the company dropped by close to 50% in April. How did all of this happen? And can anything be done to save the bank? The US government and First Republic Bank's biggest competitors have turned the fate of the lender into a game, with each side hoping the other will take care of the troubled company in order to avoid suffering significant losses. Regulators have remained silent and resisted interfering so far, as the bank's stock continues to tumble downwards. They have been waiting to see if banks that invested $30 billion in First Republic last month can come to an agreement to prevent the company from failing and taking part of their money with it. At the same time, senior officials at the FDIC have even debated whether to downgrade the bank's rating in secret a decision that would limit the bank's access to two Federal Reserve lending facilities. While senior managers at a number of large banks are hesitating to get even more involved in a way that would lock in losses, this situation has some believing that waiting will allow them to recover at least some of their deposits and that they may even fare better than they act immediately and risk throwing good money after bad. Also. The company stated in its results report that it will be reducing its employees by 20% to 25% in the upcoming quarter in addition to lowering executive salaries and eliminating office space. But one big question still remains. How did this disaster begin? Well, the problems facing First Republic are caused by its massive inventory of low-interest loans, which also includes an incredibly sizable portfolio of jumbo mortgages to high net worth individuals. Some depositors withdrew their money because those debts have lost value as a result of Federal Reserve rate increases. First Republic was forced to pay more for capital than it earns on several of its assets. As a result of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank in March, sparking doubts about the sadness of other local lenders. According to analysts, the company would suffer losses for at least a year as a result. Executives made a point of highlighting the bank's continued full functioning and the fact that it has more than enough access to cash to meet client needs in a report. Despite this, its executives admitted that they are seeking strategic options to strengthen the bank's position. Now, First Republic's viability as a standalone lender or as a component of a larger bank has been called into question by investors. Any prospective acquirer of First Republic would have to take a significant write-down in the value of lenders' assets. According to Christopher Wolf, head of North American banks at Fitch Ratings, the options are very challenging and probably very costly, especially for shareholders, Wolf said. Who's going to bear the cost? Moving on from this situation the bank has found itself in, there have been several rescue plans that have so far fallen through. According to a report from Bloomberg, First Republic was considering selling assets worth $50 to $100 billion to large banks in exchange for warrants or preferred equity that would entice the banks to pay more than market value for the holdings. The company's advisors were privately outlining a similar idea, whereby stronger banks would purchase bonds off of First Republic's books for more money than they were worth, allowing the latter to subsequently sell shares to new investors. Banks might keep the debts until full repayment even though doing so would require taking initial losses. Big banks might save money in that scenario, according to the supporters, by ensuring the security of their $30 billion in deposits and avoiding a special FDIC assessment should the regulator intervene. However, executives from some of the largest banks, speaking anonymously, have rejected the idea of once again working together to support First Republic especially given the possibility that doing so might open the door for investors or a rival to acquire the company for a low price. Although some stated a desire to take part, but only in the event that authorities made the group act. According to David Chiaverini, 
Managing Director of Equities Research at Wedbush Securities, the main concern among investors is that First Republic may enter receivership. When a failing bank enters receivership, a regulatory body or government agency seizes control of the institution and its assets, with the normal intention of selling off those assets to pay off the bank's debts. For the bank's clients, stockholders and staff, as well as for the larger financial system, going into receivership can have serious repercussions. Chiaverini noted that since their investments would be destroyed in that situation, it is the worst conceivable choice for stock and preferred shareholders. The California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation did just that on March 10th when it took control of and shuttered Silicon Valley Bank. And the New York State Department of Financial Services did the same on March 12th when it closed Signature Bank. Both were placed under the receivership of the FDIC, which sold the banks off at a significant discount. If it's necessary, a number of banks would rather that the FDIC seize First Republic Bank and sell it off. Even if banks lost money, they claimed, such a solution would be cleaner. Although, some have already taken reservations. At the end of the first quarter, the group of banks was responsible for the majority of the $50 billion in uninsured deposits held by First Republic. However, if First Republic were to be resolved, depositors would be first in line to recover money. In a worst-case scenario, according to two executives whose companies each provided $5 billion in deposits last month, they would anticipate at least partially, if not entirely, recovery of that money. First Republic's quarterly financial announcement was widely considered as a failure by the whole sector. After announcing a larger than anticipated fall in deposits, the firm's leaders gave a 12-minute briefing on the data before declining to accept questions. In the following trading session, the shares immediately tilted downward. Investors are concerned that First Republic's problems might be a sign of worse things to come for the industry as it is at the epicenter of the current banking shambles. However, Chiaverini noted that the bank's situation is distinct in that it is unusually susceptible to liquidity issues. About two-thirds of First Republic's deposits were not covered by the FDIC when the banking crisis broke out. However, according to SMP Global, First Republic had an exceptionally high ratio of 111% for loans and long-term investments to deposits at the end of last year, which means it has loaned and invested more money than it has in deposits. This is lower than Silicon Valley Bank's 94% ratio. Executives in the sector stated that First Republic may continue to operate indefinitely regardless of the stock. The FDIC has also demonstrated that it is not in haste to take over the business and expose its insurance fund to yet another multi-billion dollar loss. The apparent deadlock appears to have developed just a few weeks after U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen hailed the $30 billion injection for the financial system that she and Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, worked to orchestrate. At that time, the majority of the major U.S. banks were eager to show that they were interested in helping and to highlight their contributions in the most recent earnings reports, with Dimon claiming that all of them did the right thing. But is that really true? The US banking industry continues to crumble. It seems like a new bank is failing every week. This, together with the rising inflation, makes life for the average American harder and harder every day.